So first, um, I will uh, describe uh, Cistron uh, context and uh, the evolution of uh, our engine. So historically, uh, Cistron uh, used a rule-based uh, machine uh, translation. So um, it's an engine or, uh, that runs on linguistic facts, facts but it is manually built. <coughs> It's a uh, de deterministic uh, approach because it pro progressively builds the translation. Since the year 2007, we in introduced uh, statistical uh, post-editing. So statistical post-editing is a serial combination of rule-based machine translation and uh, statistical machine translation. The SPE layer runs on the pure text substitution, but it it has the advantage to be extracted automatically. Uh, the approach uses decoding. It means that the solution is found and not built. And recently we, um, we have a current uh, an hybrid approach. It means that the, the engine runs on linguistic facts, facts but 100% of the um, linguistic uh, knowledge is acquired from the data. The, uh, the approach uses decoding to select the bet, best hypothesis. And now I will uh, present the post-editing context. So um, uh, we offer a very um, highly customized uh, translation solution to our customer for very specific domain and usage. So for example, uh, it will be about technical documentation or online technical assistance. So uh, it's mainly a corpus-driven dri approach. So we use, in this case, uh, an SPE layer. Uh, this layer will, uh, it's a kind of correction of the rule-based approach, and it will also uh, adapt to the domain. And overall, it um, improves the, the translation quality. But still, at the end, we need, uh, there is a need for post-editing. Uh, big, big companies like uh, Cisco, Symantec, or Autodesk turn to post-editing for obvious, obvious reasons like cost saving and uh, time to market reasons. Uh, and uh, post-editors are um, professional translators. They have uh, very strict uh, guidelines to follow. So it should be light post-editing, meaning that the post-edition should not take more time than uh, retranslating from scratch. Uh, so now I will uh, present um, a study that was done by uh, Frédéric Blain. We did his PhD uh, at Cistron. So he did um, a qualitative uh, analysis of post-edited uh, data. So here you can see the overall uh, workflow. So you have the source language document that is uh, translated uh, into a target language document. Then you have the human post-edition step, and then you can finally publish your uh, target language document. Uh, so th it was a manual analysis that was done on uh, machine translation outputs for the language pair uh, Eng English to, uh, to French. He defined uh, a topology of what he called the uh, post-editing uh, actions uh, it is a minimal and logical edit that makes sense uh, linguistically. Uh, you can oppose that to m what we call uh, mechanical edits, like insertion, deletion, substitution, and move, that are captured by a traditional uh, error rate, like the TAR. The goal of this um, topology is to better represent uh, users' intent and at the end to get a finer evaluation of machine translation quality. So the first uh, observation we did is that post-editing is qu a quite redund redundant task. Many corrections of the same uh, error has to be uh, performed. A pe an interesting per perspective for us is that we can uh, in integrate on the fly users' feedback first to reduce the post-editing e effort, but also to improve uh, the post-editor experience with, by using uh, an automatic system. 
Uh, we also uh, distinguish two levels of, of edits. The first level is really an edit related to a mach uh, an error made by the machine trans translation system. And the second level of edit, it's our edits induced by the first level edit. So it's what we call propagation of the error. So in French, you will find a lot of uh, second level edit like that. When you have a, a gender and number agreement between nouns and adjectives. So here you, you, you find a, an example of such kind of uh, propagation. So you have the source sentence, then the empty output. And we see that um, the empty system uh, did a, a wrong choice for the world uh, border. So um, the, the first edi edi editing action, the minimal is the uh, chain of lexical choice bor into border. <laughs> and then you have to propagate all the correction to, uh, to respect the gender and number agreement. Uh, so, um, we define the post-editing action uh, typology based on the uh, existing uh, classification. And the four most observed classes we, we saw in that context of post-editing was a, a non-phrase related to lexical changes. The second one was the verbal phrase, which are more related to grammatical changes. And then you have the preposition change. And then at the end, the co-reference co change. So in this case, it's more when you introduce or remove a pronoun. And uh, there are other classes, but here I, I list the four, four most of them. So here you have uh, the table uh, sum up uh, the different uh, error observed. What we can say is that main part of the post-editing effort involves uh, non-phrases. It was uh, about 90%. Uh, and 60% uh, uh, of this non-phrase change were about uh, terminological uh, changes. And an, uh, another in interesting uh, number is that the top four edits cover already 30% uh, of the total which it means that if you correct uh, the top four, you already uh, improve uh, the, the quality. So the, this uh, study was interesting, um, but what, what we want to do now is to automate uh, the error categorization process. So what we want to do is to extract uh, linguistic rules that can be further uh, integrated in an engine. So it's uh, linguistically motivated. So <coughs> to do that, we use our syntactic uh, analysis. Uh, so here you can uh, see the general uh, workflow. So we perform a syntactic analysis on the both empty output and the post-edited uh, version. So we obtain uh, a bilingual uh, corpus so based on the lemma and post part of speech uh, annotations. So then we perform uh, the automatic alignment and the phrase uh, table extraction, as we usually do to, uh, to train uh, a statistical system. Here the difference is that uh, we constrain uh, the phrase extraction uh, linguistically. It means that we try to respect um, uh, linguistic constituent boundaries and compatibilities. So it's a, it's a kind of alignment at syntactic tree level. So here it, uh, it's an example of um, linguistic rule that we uh, allow. And in the end, we obtain a syntactic uh, phrase table. So then we, we look at the phrase table we obtain. We pause the, the table and we see that when we detect a source and a target uh, entries in the table that are different, it means that there was a correction. So we are able to detect and uh, already categorize the, the error. So here I, I put an example of a phrase table. The, so here we are in the context of post edition, so both entries are in the target language. So, and the rules that I put in bold, it means that 
editors uh, on this world, Fournier, were uh, done. So uh, the first experiment uh, we did was of on, on a corpus of human post-edited data. So it's a technical documentation in the computer science domain. So about um, 11,000 sentences were post-edited and uh, the system uh, was our system from uh, for English to French. So we see uh, the numbers and uh, at the end we were able to um, categorize around about 25% of the edits. So for us it's really a crucial information that can be easily and directly uh, incorporated in an engine for automate, automated uh, post-editing. It can also be easily converted to uh, bilingual uh, resources, meaning from the original source language to the target. But you can say why not more? Uh, so the process is not perfect because uh, each step uh, is error prone. So you see uh, our syntactic analysis is not perfect. The world, uh, the, the alignment uh, too. And with more data, we think that we could uh, capture uh, more rules. So here uh, I put an uh, ex example of the most uh, detected edits uh, that I, we could uh, get. So it's a lemma uh, part of speech annotation. In, in blue, do you have the lemma and the um, part of speech in red. So you see that the top four are, are really uh, simple uh, rules. And uh, it's uh, more about uh, lexical uh, choices uh, uh, that were done for in the computer science domain. So in that domain, you will talk more about build than uh, gene generation uh, and so on. Uh, so here I um, list um, the most uh, detected rules. So we can see that uh, the verb and uh, the, the rules concerning the verb and the noun are the most frequent. So um, for the conclusion, so uh, I talk about the uh, qualitative analysis of human edits that was uh, done in a previous work. That, that work enables us to define uh, uh, the typology of post-editing action. Uh, in the second uh, part, I'll talk about automatic detection and categorization. So this approach uh, already uh, gives uh, us uh, promising results still uh, it can be improved. But the important thing for us is that it can be uh, integrated, uh, easily integrating in our engine. Um, the other uh, thing, uh, we think it's an interesting topic. It, uh, it about uh, errors that are quite uh, repetitive in the post-editing context. Scores like blue, uh, won't reflect the, um, the overall uh, translation quality. If you have a lot of very small errors that are repetitive, the score, it will uh, degrade the score, but it won't give a, a good picture of the, uh, the quality. So there is a need for a global metric that will uh, help us to uh, evaluate our system and to uh, optimize them. So here are the, the references. And Thank you for attention, Mike. I'm just wondering when you do all this post-editing, what kind of background do you do? What the, the most editors you use, what kind of background do they have? Are they translators? Yes, they are professional translators. Yes. And what kind of instructions do you give them? I mean, the, the, the post edition should be very light and close to the machine translation output. Otherwise, they better retranslate from scratch. Again. It, it makes no sense if you have more than uh, three or four errors. It's, uh, it's, they spend more time than uh, editing. So you can talk some 
some like you don't see problems, they they deal with them or they don't. Sorry. I mean, if they've got some very light currency problems, like I don't know, syntactic differences, things which don't sound very natural, maybe in the Italian language. Yeah. Are they supposed to or not just do basic? Very yeah, do basic. Uh, <coughs> Have you ever experimented with pre-editing? Pre-editing, so... So in uh, key banking, we find that, of course, uh, we do semi-automatic <coughs> analysis where a parser runs and then human annotators correct the parser's output, <coughs> like the post-editing. But we've also found that it can be quite effective to do certain kinds of pre-editing where there are certain things that are very easy and quick for humans to indicate that are actually quite likely to be gotten wrong with follow-on effects by the parser. And so it saves time if, go, if the humans go through and just do two or three of these things per sentence. So you mean in, uh, in the context of the... So in the context of translation, there would be certain words that you think are problematic. You, you, you will like, highlight... Uh, so, well, the, the program would say, all right, here's a place where we think the translation, I mean, if you knew the translation was going to be wrong, then you might just correct it. Yeah, but, it's a kind of it, confidence you estimation. Think the translation might be wrong. Yeah, so. it's a kind of confidence estimation, a predictor. Uh, a predictor yeah, yeah, we think about that, but we didn't uh, implement it in our product. Uh, it's an interesting predictive question in the context of this. Uh, um, uh, this workshop to ask not can we do not only confidence estimation on the output of a system but prediction of places where a system is likely to get into trouble and where a little bit of human help might improve its performance quite a bit. But with using this kind of confidence measure uh, we have really to work on the ergonomy because at the end, we are really in an industrial process. Uh, the translator has to edit quickly, so it shouldn't uh, take more time to look at the uh, confidence score. I mean, uh, it's an interesting... Well, well, I'll, uh, I'll discuss this in my talk tomorrow, but the, some of the people who have been working on historical tree banks at the end have uh, managed to increase the human productivity from a few hundred words per hour to between 10 and 20,000 words per hour. So it, you can have quite a large impact here. But what we can do, plan to do is like uh, Lucia was talking about, it's more at the document uh, level. I mean, you have a batch of documents to process. You could imagine that you uh, you put a confidence score on the uh, on the document, and you, for example, you can say, uh, I will put a very easy to translate document to, uh, for example, a rookie translator, so they will t take more time and very difficult uh, document to translate to a more uh, professional uh, translator. I mean, it's a dem demand uh, from our customer on this kind of uh, process button. Is this difficult enough to be a question that is uh, more your question? There's some of the uh, prediction and source based and source only, so before you can do an optimization, you still get a source and see if it's a translatable data. And Xerox uh, research, Kernel was doing some work on then trying to understand why it's not translatable and modifying it automatically. So if it's a long sentence, can you break it into shorter sentences and that will be translatable and then you get a higher confidence score there. So before it gets to the post editor, so we don't have to read anything. So this is quite recent with all of this. Last question.